Today's episode of the Energy Question Podcast is brought to you by Inveris. The energy industry faces challenges every day, and the events of the last two years have caused massive disruptions like never before. Companies in the energy industry need actionable intelligence and a single source of truth that brings all the data together. Inveris is the energy specialized technology partner that provides intelligent connections for a global energy ecosystem. Only Inveris has the analytics, people, experience, and industry scope to connect the right data and and information in the right way to discover missed opportunities and deliver fast outcomes. Find out more at Inveris.com. That's E-N-V-E-R-U-S.com. Hello and welcome to the Energy Question with David Blackman. I'm David Blackman and my special guest today is Tom Pyle, the president of the Institute for Energy Research. Uh, out of Washington, D.C. Tom, thanks so much for for being on the show with us today. Absolute pleasure, Dave. Good to talk to you again. Hey, before we get into the interview, I want to talk with you about a lot of current events going on in the energy space. Sure. Just for our audience, uh, because this is your first appearance on our podcast, talk about what you do at at IER and the American Energy Alliance there in Washington and kind of uh, the, the history and background of the two groups. Uh, Happy to. So IR is a research and education organization, a charitable foundation, if you will. Um, It's been around for a real long time. It was had it was founded by a gentleman named Rob Bradley in Houston, a real long time ago. And I took it over around uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I had a few jobs in uh, in Washington D.C., including working on Capitol Hill doing policy work, and then a little politics in the House leadership. Circles, and then I got a real, ex- real world experience uh, running um, government affairs for a major uh, multinational uh, uh, energy and and commodities company. And then I ran my own business for a while, and and was basically one of those lobbyists that everyone keeps talking about. <laughs> and I actually ran into IR, and they be, they be, they were a client of mine. Um, and then um, I fell in love with the organization and, and they were looking for a president uh, and, and lo and behold, the, the match happened. So IER is for the folks, uh, this is the important part. We are the sort of true north, um, a free market uh, research and, and the Institute uh, or, and the American Energy Alliance is the advocacy arm. Of, of, of the Institute. And we are, we are basically... Uh, times change, people change, issues change, but we stay the same. Uh, we we analyze these policies that are coming out of Washington and the state house, and we determine what what impacts they have on the industry, on markets, and more importantly, and most importantly, on people like you and me, consumers, folks who pay our utility bills and fill our gas tanks. So, we're a watchdog uh, for the politicians uh, in Washington and the state houses, and uh, we. Um, Hope that uh, the folks who who turn in, uh, sort of pay attention to us, follow us, uh, and pick up our stuff, are both learning about these issues and also uh, how to effectively engage in the in the process so their voices can be heard. Yeah, and you're not an anti renewables, anti nuclear, anti anything organization, right? You advocate and talk about good, sane, sound energy policy that would benefit the country, correct? Absolutely. We, we have nothing against any energy source. What we are against is this idea that politicians and bureaucrats uh, can decide what's best for us. Right. Um, uh, generally speaking, historically speaking, interventions, government interventions in energy markets have led to uh, at, at, at the you know, minimum confusion, uh, distorted markets. But what we have found, and and increasingly we're living in a world where the ramifications of these policies uh, are resulting in an unstable, unreliable energy grid, uh, very expensive electricity prices, very expensive gasoline prices, wars. Um, I mean, I've you know, we've sort of been warning people that the more that the government gets involved in this space, the worse it's going to be. And then, you know, they find themselves in a in a pickle, in a jam, 
And their solution is more intervention, more government, (laughs) more policies laid on top, which then makes it even worse. Um, And then we're, we're in this spiral now uh, where, you know, we'll we'll get out of it at some point, but if you look at what's going on in Europe, for example, if you look at, you know, just yesterday, I read that the Northeast is talking about rationing electricity during, during cold snaps, right? The Northeast. I mean, yeah. the United States of America, it's rationing crazy, yeah. energy. So, um, you know, our goal is is to is to get us beyond this, uh, is to get us to a point where we're winding down this in- intervention instead of ramping it up. And it's not easy because once a politician, once a program is created, once a subsidy is is put on the books, there's a constituency that is benefiting from that and then it becomes really difficult to undo that or get rid of that uh, yeah. and that's what we're living that's the world we're living in right now unfortunately well i talk about it a lot on on the, the energy transition podcast that i do with armando cabana and arena slav every week about my belief that we literally have the worst possible class of people in our societies in the western world making energy policy decisions i mean I think personally that the the first hundred names in the phone book of any city in America could do a better job making these decisions than the political class does. I mean, really, truly, do you you disagree with that? No, other than that, you dated yourself because my kids don't know what a phone book is. (laughs) Well, that's true. There aren't phone books anymore. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Google the first hundred names, uh, uh, you know, of any any residents in any city. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Look, it's to me, it's pretty simple. We built an energy system in this country that was that moved away from distributed generation, that moved away from renewables, intermittent energy sources. We built an automobile industry that at one time the market share for electric vehicles was about 30% of the fleet. Now, granted, there weren't that many, nearly as many right, cars back years then, ago. but yeah, it's, yeah. it's not like it's a new technology. Yeah. The market evolved in such a way that we became more efficient. We had electricity and gasoline. We had products and services from these resources that made our lives vastly, that improved our, our lives significantly, that has gotten people out of poverty that has created a luxury and a lifestyle that we've, we've, you know, we've benefited from. Energy is literally the capacity to do work, right? Right. So the more work that can be done by machines, by, you know, all this other great stuff, the less we have to do, the more we can focus on other things that are important to us. What we have seen over the last, say, 15 years, I want to say longer, but let's just call it 15 years, is we've had a very organized, strident, um, small, I would argue fairly small, but powerful minority who has slowly but surely um, co-opted one political party into believing that we should get off of completely three sources of energy, coal, oil, and natural gas, without a thought about how to do that. Right. <laughs> other than with other than other than taking s- s- things that are already in existence and try to make them better. By that, I mean, largely renewables, wind and solar. Right. Again, not new technologies. When 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 was the thing? You know, we had we had mills that turned water to make power and we had windmills. Right. And we moved away from them. Now we're, we're moving back towards them. But the problem is, is they're just, they're not getting it done. And they're tremendously expensive. And the ramifications are now sort of, you know, vivid, like right in our faces, right? If you look at what's going on in Europe, you look at California, even in in your beloved state of Texas, we've had challenges uh, and the Northeast. So we can unpack all those, but I just thought it'd be nice to have a big picture here. Yeah. Where... When we were growing up, we never worried about whether the lights were going to be on. Never. Ever. So here we are. <laughs> let's not say how many years later since we were kids, but now it's a, it's a, it's part of the conversation. 
Oh yeah, and it's just like people talk about it as if as if well, this is normal. Well, it's not normal. Yeah. It doesn't have to be normal. None of this exactly. has to be normal. And it's all it's all because of decisions politicians have made. Talk about the Northeast. You know why is the Northeast talking about rationing energy right now? You know better than anybody. You know, talk to about why we're having that conversation uh, in the United States, and it's it's a it's a story completely caused by by politicians making bad energy policy choices, isn't it? Absolutely. So you just take a look at the 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 sort of the soup up in the Northeast. You have um, politicians in some of these states: New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, all these states who want to get off of these, these energy resources, namely coal and nuclear in particular. Yeah. And so they have, they zero have accelerated. That's zero carbon yes. emission nuclear, right? Okay. Anyway. <laughs> we can get into the irony of that too. Yeah. So they, they, in the rush to like appear to be saving the planet, they accelerated the closing down of these sources of electricity that were always on, always available, always reliable. And at the same time, they haven't replaced it with anything. Um, and the result is less electricity generation, which means that it's A, more expensive, and B, it, it could actually not be there when we need it. And we've seen yeah. already examples in the Northeast where we've had extreme freeze situations where they've increased the spot price of natural gas into the thousands of dollars. Right. The other thing is, is that they refuse to allow the infrastructure necessary to bring natural gas from the the places where it's being produced in Pennsylvania to Massachusetts, for example. So 150 mile pipeline could resolve a lot of these bottlenecks fairly easily. They yeah. refuse to have these pipelines permitted and and, and therefore constructed. Then they say, okay, where are we going to get the gas? All right, well, we got to get it from somewhere. So they import it from Russia. Or Algeria, they import it yeah. from, and, and so they move it, they move it from far away, put it in diesel boats, diesel tankers, and wheel it all the way into to the Northeast, the Boston Harbor, if you will. And then they get it into market. And How they pay European the prices for it right absolutely they're yeah. paying more they're getting less and if you think you talked about nuclear decommissioning a nuclear plant carbon free you talk about importing uh, natural gas from thousands of miles away as opposed to 100 miles away that's not better for the environment so what are they doing it for right that's to right. me the big question always is if if your decisions are leading to worse outcomes for your stated objectives then what are your real objectives? Because there's got to be something I'm missing. Yeah, and 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 this doesn't even talk about the Jones Act. I mean, they can't bring LNG from the Chenier facilities in Louisiana or Texas uh, because the Jones Act requires uh, transfers of any cargoes from one U.S. port to another to be a U.S. flag vessel staffed by. U.S. employees, and those don't exist, right? I mean, we're not making LNG tankers in the States. Right. Yeah, yeah so, so it's just crazy. An, that was a um, law that was passed during World War II. It actually goes back to, all the way to the Civil War, doesn't it? Okay. I, I, yeah, I think it goes of... back to the Civil War. It was, it, anyway, anyway. Either way, the point is, is it was designed <laughs> to help keep a fleet a u.s fleet of mer a u.s merchant fleet right? right now it has become what all these programs become a special interest you've got a small handful of politicians in a, in a narrowly divided congress that refuse to reform and improve the laws in this country that determine the types of energy we use and and, and all of that so yeah i mean it's a real mess uh, and i always it always segues me into the the Greens, uh, the environmental movement. I've been in D.C. for way too long, 30 <laughs> years or so. They have changed significantly. Yes, uh, they have. Uh, as, a, as a movement. They were, at one time, they were concerned about a lot of different things. 
now they they sacrifice all of their advocacy all their lobbying on the altar of this climate issue and they have become very very powerful as i mentioned earlier in the democratic party and the result yeah. is is that if in order for the democrats to reward their constituents the the the, the special interests that move that drive that create the resources and the organizations that help the Democrats win elections, they have become this, this extreme party that if you, if you watch the last uh, uh, the Democrat uh, nomination process, they, they were all on stage trying to outdo each other on who hates coal, oil, and natural gas more. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. And it's it's be, become becoming a um, a problem when you look at big states like California, and New York, and the damage that they're doing, and the damage that they're causing their uh, their constituents there, right? I mean, my parents lived in California for a long time. When they retired, they wanted to live there, you know, uh, all that. Sure. They ended up moving to Nevada because they got sick of paying the high prices. They got sick of being told you might have to like, you know, you might have to, we might have to do a rolling brownout in your area because it's too hot today. Right. Why right. would they want to deal with that stuff? They had the, fortunately they had the means to be able to move, but not everyone does. And they're, they're all stuck with these policies, unfortunately. Yeah. I, you know, and it's so interesting to me, like last week I, I interviewed the CEO of a Norwegian based battery manufacturer that's making a big entry into the United States. And, um, you know, we spent five or 10 minutes talking about the energy mix in Norway, which is very heavily hydropower. And, and I have a point here uh, that I'm going to get to, but, you know, it's like 75, 80% of their electricity is generated by, by hydroelectric dams. And you go to California and one of the big news items last week was, yeah, they've approved uh, now the destruction of four big hydroelectric dams on the Klamath River to protect uh, a subspecies of salmon. And I'm not in favor of, you know, salmon going extinct. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's other ways to protect those salmons than destroying those dams. And, and so at a time when California already has to import so much electricity from other states, they're demolishing a couple of thousand megawatts of, of generating capacity on that river. And, and, and it's those kinds of things that are just really kind of crazy. And, and isn't, you know, one of the really unfortunate aspects of that is that so many other states have laws now that require them to adopt California emission standards, right? And I guess that's limited to automobiles, but, uh, but you know, it's just, it, it's the craziest state in the country on energy and all these other states, you know, rush to emulate everything they do. So it's, it's, it's really a difficult thing for the whole country, isn't it? Every decision they make. Give you a perfect example. They want to go to all electric vehicles, right? Well, California and now a European country, it might've been Norway. I'd have to go back and look. California last summer said, oh, we have an extreme weather situation. We have to cut back on our electricity. Yeah. Don't charge your EVs <laughs> right. for the next two days. Well, if the whole world is supposed to be driving, riding around in electric vehicles and they don't want you to charge them on certain days, what does that mean for you? Right. Right. And they just said it recently, I think, in Norway. It might have been Norway. Correct Switzerland. me if I'm wrong. Switzerland. Switzerland, Switzerland. Yeah. where they said, oh, you can't drive your EV at all <laughs> unless you're going to the doctor or the emergency room. And right? you can't recharge it either because of the load it puts on the grid. This is an, a, an insane disruption of our daily lives yeah. by government fiat as a result, again, of the policies that they are, they themselves view as utopia, right? That they're right. the ones who are pushing. They're the ones who are advancing these policies. So we expect our government to sit around and make decisions for us about what kinds of energy we use, what kinds of cars we drive, what days. It's like, remember back in the seventies where we had our every other day gasoline, you know, uh, 
situation where we could only go on Tuesdays and Thursdays or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. We got past that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that there there's a huge mistake out there that you can't have your cake and eat it too. We can have affordable, reliable energy. We can be energy sufficient. Uh, we can be energy. Um, I don't like the word independent because yeah. it's a global commodity. I agree. Right? Like, I agree. Yeah. You know, we've got Canada and everything else, but we can have energy security. We can have economic security and we, we can and continue to have environmental improvement all at the same time but you've got to have faith and trust in markets to do that because every time these politicians create some grand plan of, of how to make our lives better they end up making us pay more and it makes us uh, us less uh it makes it us it makes it less convenient for us as well at the same time now that's just for people who have the means for others right. who don't it becomes a decision for them what they're going to do that week. Am I going to buy it, pay for a prescription? Am I going to, you know, what kind of food can I afford versus, you know, whether I fill my tank or pay my utility bill and guess who gets, you know, the short end of the stick Well, Santa had, you know, Santa wasn't as good to the kids this year. Right. Right. Or that vacation that they were allowed, that they were planning on taking has to be put on hold or, as you've seen with the spending, with the with with credit, um, you know, going up, people are leveraging themselves again, just right. for personal expenses. So, uh, and then you know, if you look at the situation in Europe, okay, this might be a little controversial, but I, this is a Green New Deal war. Okay. Yes. Yes. Exactly. The only reason <laughs> that Vladimir Putin was able to invade Ukraine was because he had whether he was in cahoots with others, we can get into that. He had leverage over Western Europe. Yep. He's selling get natural gas and now LNG at record amount. He's making more money off his energy than before the war. In spite of all this talk about, you know, sanctions and restricting and price caps on his oil and everything else, the Europeans, Germany, France, they're not even like daring to talk about, re, you know, restricting their access to the natural gas from Russia. Right. Why? Because they built a dependency to the point where if they did that, lots and lots of people would die this winter. So, uh, it, it, you know, these policies in Europe are being replicated here by, you know, certain politicians in certain states and, and, and the guy in the White House right now. And all you gotta do is look there to see where the future lies, unless we do something about it. Right. And you talk about the Green New Deal. You know, people look at the at the IRA, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, and think, well, boy, that's expensive—369 billion in new subsidies. But but in reality, in the mind of the Democratic Party, the collective mind of Democrat policymakers in Washington, do you agree? I, mean, I keep telling people, look, that's just a down payment. That bill's a down payment. That's not the whole cost. Don't you think, in their view, that's just the first tranche of what's going to become repeated over and over again, those kinds of uh, incredibly expensive pieces of legislation to subsidize you know, the, the entirety of the Green New Deal that AOC rolled out a few years ago? Oh, absolutely. If they have their way, um, you know, here, here's the thing. The challenge is the wisdom of the voters is that Whenever the, you know, whenever a punitive policy has been on the table, and by that, I mean a, a, a carbon tax, for example, like in Washington state, where you have a deep, deep blue state, you have a crazy governor, um, they, <laughs> have tried, crazy governor. <laughs> they have tried and failed at least three times now to impose a carbon tax on the citizens of Washington state. Right. Right. They tried to do uh, what was called cap and trade here in Washington, D.C., where they tried to impose a cap on emissions. Um, and it was a hidden carbon tax, but it was mm -hmm. a regulation. They have trouble getting these regulations through because people intuitively understand that they're basically the ones who are going to pay for that. And so what they have done, they've shifted 
um, into this world where, okay, well, if we're not going to force people to pay for their, their decisions to use these energy resources, uh, we're going to basically create a condition where we're going to give the, the preferred energy sources that we like so much cash and such an advantage in the marketplace that we're by, we're going to sort of, we call it an energy transition. We're, we're going to force an energy transition with your tax dollars. So you're still paying, but the difference is, is that like, you're not paying a direct tax. You're just basically paying these companies and these and automobile companies are getting subsidies. GM, oh, Ford, huge. Yeah. Uh, utilities are getting <clears throat> subsidies. Some, you know, this chips bill that passed, you know, massive profitable companies are getting your tax dollars. We have moved into what I call a dark time where basically big corporations are teaming up with the government and they're just taking the, the money that you send to Washington and put it in their pockets. Exactly. And then corporate, passing corporate the cost socialism. on to you. Yeah, it's corporate exactly. socialism. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah, I had um, an and uncle. It, and it doesn't. Go ahead, go ahead. I just can say, just to close, it's not helping. Eight, 30 years ago, 80% of the energy for the world, the energy used, consumed, was from three sources, coal, oil, and natural gas. Today, 30 years later, with, with trillions, trillions of dollars, of dollars in subsidies, the money that they took out of our pockets and the pockets of everyday Europeans in Europe, trillions of dollars in subsidies for wind and solar, and that number is 79%. Mm -hmm. So and, trillions and 30 of dollars years, got you. What's, what do you think it's going to be in 30 years, 30 years from now and trillions of dollars more? Where do you think it'll be? 78%, yeah. 78%, yeah. who knows, right? right? My attitude is this. If something came along that replaced oil, that was market, that was a market-based product that or technology, I'm all for it. I'm not for oil. I'm for the products, the energy sources that provide the most bang for the buck, right? For, for, for us, um, we, you know, gasoline was a waste product, uh, back in the day, right? Before they didn't know what to do with it. So they just kind of like, whatever, this is just a waste <laughs> right. product yeah. until they figured out what to do with it. Right. They were, they were cracking oil to crude to make propane basically. Right. And they replaced the oil lamps in the Northeast in Massachusetts with oil that used to be fuel oil that used to be whale blubber, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I guess my point is that we, we transition when the market says a product is cheaper, safer, faster, better. Right. Right. And those have been the big changes in our lives. The industrial revolution was a perfect example. We ran out of wood. Europe, UK was running out of wood. They clear cut it almost all of Europe. They got this coal. What do they do with it? Well, they figured out what to do with it and boom, the whole world changed, right? Internal right. combustion engine, same thing, right? These changes take place. I was, uh, we were watching a Christmas parade the other day and, and they had uh, the horses walk, you know, riding by the Clydesdales or whatever. And two of them just... <laughs> They did their thing right yeah. in front of all yeah. of us. And my kids are like, ew, gross. Like, <laughs> imagine the entire transportation system being yeah. horses and buggies, right? And that transition occurred because A, it was cheaper, faster, better, safer, right? That's why this EV thing isn't working because EVs aren't cheaper, better, faster, or safer than internal Oh, no, nobody vehicles. can afford them. What, the top 5% income earners in America can actually afford an EV right now and that's with all the exactly. subsidies right yeah exactly. you know it's 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 just crazy you talk about the horses doing their thing the whole city of new york used to be a giant manure pile i mean they had literally thousands of public employees every day trying to come along and clean up all the manure off the streets and then you, right. you you mentioned wood what's happening with with wood to generate electricity now especially in europe <laughs> 
Yeah, well, this, this is, is the, the other, the other, the other ridiculous thing. Yeah. So they categorize wood as a you know renewable <laughs> or a green fuel, right? And so now they're they're once again ripping through all the forests. Yeah, and America's forests too. They're, they're, yeah, absolutely. And they're creating, you know, they're they're sort of sh shaving it all down and making pellets and doing all that good stuff. So they can check a box and say, look, this is how much renewable energy that we're generating. Meanwhile, yeah. we're, we're back to pre-industrial revolution where they basically burn wood for fuel. And the thing about it is, is Europe right now is struggling so mightily that companies like Volkswagen recently announced they're not building any new manufacturing plants in Europe until they figure out how to provide low cost, uh, reliable electricity again. Right. So the, and, and companies are literally like idle right now because they're not taking that risk, right? They're not going and, and companies, startups aren't going to do business in Europe. So Europe is going to lose its manufacturing base as a result of all of this garbage as well. Right. And you, that's not easily replaced, right? We've seen that struggle here in the United States, uh, once it's gone, it takes a long time for that stuff to come back. Right. And you have to figure out how to become competitive again. I mean, I wrote a story at Forbes this week, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, talking about how, oh, gosh, you know, the Biden subsidies, they're going to bankrupt our economy here in Europe. We have to find ways to, to fight back. Well, it's too late. I mean, it, it, there was another story on Monday talking about how demand for natural gas has suddenly gone way down in Europe as we go into winter. Well, why is that? It's because all the factories are being idle right. <laughs> because they can't get a natural gas that they can afford to operate on. And so- Yeah, there's one good way to lower, there's one good way to lower energy prices. Just don't offer any. Sure, yeah. <laughs> you know, totally, that's the solution. Totally works. Yeah. And that's the funny part about all of this is You've created this situation that I call it the death spiral of subsidization. Yeah. Because we have created so many subsidies for so many different niche things in the energy space that when you do one here, the Europeans say, Oh, you're messing with my subsidy, right? Like that's not fair. We need you need to fix that and change that. And then they go, okay, well, we'll reduce this or get rid of that one if you get rid of this one and you get rid of that <laughs> one. And meanwhile, you've got Bureaucrats and politicians basically pretending that they know best about yeah, they you know, have how to the make answer. electricity, right. which, you know, they're not, go to the DMV, right? So. <laughs> oh, God. Well, listen, man, these half hours go so fast. I, I, I may just have to turn this into an hour long deal, but we're running out of time. I I would sure like to have you back on soon to, to you know, maybe... Uh, in January, even to talk about the upcoming Congress and get your views on what you think might happen over the next two years. If, if you don't mind yeah, me calling I'm, on you. I don't mind at all. In fact, I, I probably, uh, we were probably supposed to talk about that, but I got, I got <laughs> no, that's all, okay. all no, this, this other perfect. stuff. So that's This great. is perfect. No. Yeah. I think the, the main thing is this, folks need to understand we don't need the government to tell us what kind of energy we, we can use and what kind of cars we can drive and how to live our lives. We can do just fine by ourselves. The collective, we millions of people making decisions about, you know, product preference and market, you know, forces. That's what results in the changes that you want. Right? Yeah. That's what creates these advances in technology, these, these, these improvements in our lives, right? Environmental, uh, environmental health is is a priority for the for everybody um government doesn't have a monopoly on how to make the environment cleaner in fact i argue that hydraulic fracturing has done more to reduce co2 oh. emissions than any single regulation any paris agreement any rio summit yeah. any inflation reduction act has all done combined and right. that was a result of technology and thank you oil industry Right. right. The green should be thanking the oil and gas industry for that, because that has done what they say that they want, which is fewer emissions. Yeah. But but fracking is not their preferred rent seeking industry. So they feel obligated to oppose it. Right. I mean, right. that's the truth of it, isn't it? That's really the truth. Abs yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. Right down yeah. to it.
So. Well, man, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. And, and, and we'll, we'll do this again soon and, and really get into a policy discussion next time. But this was perfect. And I really appreciate it. So take care. Have a happy holiday. Same to you. Merry Christmas, everybody. And thank you to our sponsor, Inveris. We couldn't do this without you. And to Stu Turley and the Sandstone Group for hosting our podcast. And to our extraordinary producer, Eric Perel. I'm David Blackman. And that's all for today. Thank you.